Our gospel reading this morning is from the fifth chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of God for the people of God. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Come, Holy Spirit, into this sanctuary we call home. We ask that you fill our hearts and kindle within us the fire of your love. Through thy words and the meditation of our hearts, together may we glorify you, our God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Many of us are in professions where we present materials, either to our colleagues, our students, or even at social events. It can be either be one of the best experiences you've ever had, or it could be one of the worst experiences. I want to open this morning's message with a story written by Marta Kagan, who is the managing editor of the integrated marketing agency named Expresso. She wrote a story a couple years ago about the world's most captivating presenters. The story begins by her describing a very cold January morning where her alongside thousands of other people, many who had camped out for 12 hours, waited outside the Moscone Center, which is the largest convention and exhibition complex in San Francisco. She added that the security detail alone rivaled that of the Democratic or Republican national conventions, I'm going to add to that, it could probably rival today's Super Bowl with the amount of security that is there today. After a very long wait, a thin man, soft-spoken, he graced the stage in his signature turtleneck and jeans, cleared his throat, took a couple sips of water, and then he paused for about 12 seconds before uttering the following words. This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. This was a scene on January 9th, 2007, when Steve Jobs unveiled the most revolutionary device the world had ever seen. This was the most captivating product launches ever witnessed in advertising. But it wasn't the product that inspired people to show up on a cold day and camp out overnight. It was actually Jobs' unique presentation style. Anyone who is an avid Apple fan knows that Steve Jobs was referred to as Steve Note which made the keynote address the most awe-inspiring, memorable presentations ever delivered. 
Carmelio Gallo, a communications expert and coach, states in his books, The Presentation Secrets of Steve Jobs, Steve transformed the typical, dull, technical, plodding slideshow into a theatrical event complete with heroes, villains, a supporting cast, and stunning backdrops. People who witness a Steve Jobs presentation for the first time describe it as an extraordinary experience. When Steve Jobs introduced the world to the iPod, he could have said something like this. Today we're introducing a new portable music player, weighs 6.5 ounces, it's about the size of a sardine can, uh, voluminous capacity, long battery life, and lightning fast transfer speed. But he didn't. He said, iPod, 1,000 songs in your pocket. Jobs could have described the MacBook Air as a small, lighter MacBook Pro with a generously sized 13.3 inch, 1280 by 800 pixel glossy LED screen and a full size keyboard. Instead, he walked on the stage with an office sized manila envelope, pulled the notebook out, and simply said, What is MacBook Air? In a sentence, it's the world's thinnest notebook. One thing I've learned throughout the years, even if you're not an author or an actor or a great entrepreneur, chances are you're going to be standing in front of a group of people delivering a presentation of some kind at some point in your career. And that's not all. According to Nancy Duarte, a communications expert behind Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth, says that presenters will dedicate roughly 30 hours to researching, organizing, sketching, putting all their notes together for one hour of a presentation. Later, they'll invest another 30 hours to building the technical supports that goes along with that presentation and then practice and practice and practice how it flows. In today's digital world, the sheer act of presenting, it has to be powerful. It has to be memorable and contain specific statements that consistently add up to 140 characters. <clears throat> so why 140 characters? It has to be tweetable. Even ministry has gone digital. You can go online 24-7 and find spiritual care, formation, prayer, evangelism, and any other manifestations of grace. More and more people gather to nurture, explore, and share their faith in online spaces. Churches have become almost obsolete. Let's face it. So many people come to church for three things. When they're hatched, when they're matched, and when they're dispatched. <laughs> if Jesus were here today, or if Twitter had been an available app 2,000 years ago, would Jesus have used it as a communication tool to reach a larger audience? Would Jesus have used social media to spread his message? You'll be surprised to know that Jesus was actually the first one who used tweets. What I mean is that if you look really close to a lot of the things that Jesus says, they are short, memorable phrases. For example, love one another. That would have fit the Twitter rule of 140 characters. Could even put a hashtag in there. What if the Sermon on the Mount had been live streamed or posted on YouTube? Jesus was able to capture people's attention 
which meant he must have had a very dynamic speech and approach without a PA system. He must have been a strong speaker. If you put yourself on the side of that hill, sitting with Jesus, you would probably witness a very sensitive, poetic man that stirred the people of that time. The Sermon on the Mount <clears throat> is probably the best known and the least followed of all of Jesus' teachings. He challenged people, he challenged them to a standard of living that was radically different from anything people had ever heard. The point that was made during this Sermon of the Mount, on the Mount, was not live like this and you will be a Christian, but rather because you are a Christian, live like this. Because you are a Christian, live like this. This sermon is all about how we are meant to live, and this has been called the Beatitudes. The words of the Beatitudes are very familiar ones. But I bet if I asked you if your lives have been changed by them, you would probably say no. This passage is very short, very dense. So dense that the more you look at each Beatitude, the less you seem to understand it. I guess it would depend on what you think the Beatitudes are. If you think they are a requirement to get into heaven, then you will want to make sure you've got them clearly defined and you understand each one of them. For your life will depend on it and your ability to follow them. If you think they are a set of divine instruction for righteous living, then you'll want to do what the Pharisees did in the Old Testament. Break them down into umpteen, clear, and manageable applications. We would have a difficult time making sense of each of the Beatitudes. For example, let's look at <clears throat> blessed are the peacemakers. Well, peace between who? And on what occasion? And how much of it do I have to do? What if Jesus came right through the doors? He would wake up, we would wake up, stop looking at our watches, and turn our heads. We would feel his presence as soon as he walked up the aisle. He comes up here and he opens his mouth and the Beatitudes come out. We would be wondering, what's he doing? He actually is painting a picture, offering us a vision of hope. He starts with the word blessed. What does that mean? It isn't a religious word. It's just something that means happy, something that means fortunate. We are all looking for happiness. And Jesus is offering us a way to get there. This isn't a legal or ethical text. It's a statement, a vision. And so here Jesus is offering us a promise. Come out of the assumptions of our world. Come and live in his, and we will receive blessings. It won't look like the blessings we're used to but it will connect us with God, and it will never leave us. Now let's imagine that Jesus is here, that he is speaking the words of the Beatitudes directly to us, and that we are hearing them for the first time. If this is where happiness can be found, Let's filter out the voices which tell us 
they're to be found somewhere else. Let's try to listen again with fresh minds. Let's listen to these words not as instructions, but as a vision, not as details which have been pinned down and analyzed, but as a promise, a sketch to a new world, a world of new possibilities. The Beatitudes are broken down into two categories, ones that prepare our character towards God, and the others are to prepare our character towards each other. If we looked at the Beatitudes today, it would look a little bit different. Jim Paradis is a Filipino musician, producer, educator, writer, television personality. He has a blog called Writing on Air. In his blog, he takes a modern-day approach <clears throat> excuse me, to the ancient scriptures and titles it Modern Day Beatitudes. Blessed are the strange, the weird, the people we laugh at, those who do not fit our mold, especially the socially wretched and despised. By their presence in our lives, they expand our reality, on our part reluctantly and on theirs so painfully, by forcing us to look at them in the hope that we see the God in them. Blessed are the depressed and the addicted, for they are called upon to demonstrate the healing miracles of God through their own awakening. Blessed are the broken, those who fail, those who fall below our expectations, for they are asked to show the rest of us that not being perfect is part of a human condition that accepting our imperfection is the first step in our realization of the divine perfection that is in each and every one of us. Blessed are the nameless, the faceless, the dispossessed, the refugees, the homeless, and the poor, for they point us to the way to compassion. But their sheer numbers, they tell us that ultimately, the experience of compassion is inescapable. Blessed are the cruel, the calloused, and the unscaring. For on some deep, unconscious level, they choose to delay their own liberation so that others may be enlightened by their example. Blessed are those who arouse us to anger, who bring out the worst in us, for they force us out of the denial that we harbor within, that we are hooked on them, that they resonate with something hidden inside of us. And to break free, we must let go of our misguided moral superiority. Blessed are those who cause us to suffer repeatedly by their mistakes. For they are tutors who spend valuable time so that we learn our lessons as well. Blessed are those who do not seem to have a life, and especially those who do not have a choice. Those who are physically debilitated, paralyzed, or in a coma and cannot move. For they bring us message that is, a lo that is lost in this age of frenzy. That to be worthy of God's love, we need not strive to do or achieve anything, but simply be. Just be. Blessed are all of us. For whatever condition we find ourselves in, we can choose to remember our true nature, our original blessings, and our own timeliness. I open this morning's message describing a thin, soft-spoken man who not only graced the stage in his signature turtleneck and jeans, but was one of the most powerful pre presenters 
in our generation. In 1997, Apple debuted its now famous Think Different campaign, which featured a series of black and white images of iconic figures like Albert Einstein, Martin Luther King, and Amelia Earhart. While those images flashed on the screen, the following words were spoken. Here to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square hole, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some people see them as crazy, we see them as genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change this world are the ones who do. The goal of the Think Different campaign, it was to sell a product. This is what I want to leave with you this morning. A challenge to think differently about the world you live in. To see things radically. To be crazy enough to think that you can change it one act of love at a time. One act of love at a time. Hallelujah and amen.